Welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast, hosted by Dave Roberts. Humanity possesses a unique skill, the ability to pass knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. This podcast embraces that ability, offering learning opportunities through conversations with extraordinary guests. Dave aims to leave a positive mark on individuals around the world. So before you dive into today's episode, please share this podcast with your network, including friends, family, and colleagues. And please consider leaving a rating or review. Your support makes all the difference. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts, and today it is my pleasure to have as my guest contributor, Mary Beth Decker. Mary Beth Decker is considered an expert in intuitive animal communication, medical intuition, and energy healing. In her sessions, she offers more than just animal communication. Using these three methods, she leads pets and their people to a place of emotional, behavioral, and physical healing. Based on her extensive experience with animal transitions, Mary Beth wrote the Amazon bestseller Peace and Passing, Comfort for Loving Humans During Animal Transitions. Her book provides a roadmap to help guardians navigate this difficult leg of their animal's life. To date, Mary Beth has completed over 1,500 sessions with people and their pets. Her clients have come from Australia, Canada, the Czech Republic, England, the French West Indies, Scotland, Switzerland, and Thailand, as well as the U.S. Mary Beth, welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to have you as a guest contributor today. Thanks, Dave. I'm so excited to be here and talk with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, you're welcome. And as an animal lover, um, I was very fascinated with what you do with animal communication. And I'm just excited to see what you have to offer to our, our listeners and our viewers today. With that, my first question is, please tell our listeners about the experiences that have shaped your life path, your life passions. Wow. That's always a good one. I'll do a quick version, but I would, I would say that the first thing that, that probably was so exciting to me as I look back was back in the day when I was somewhere in middle school, I had, a, had an experience with the creator that just shifted me into knowing that there really is a creator behind all this and they're loving and they care about us, and they're intelligent. I say they because it didn't come through as uh, having a feminine or masculine, interestingly enough, because I asked, I asked God back then, are you real? Or do you really exist? And I got a very visual, excuse me, visceral answer. And that kind of tucked in for me that spiritual stuff is real, even at that age, yeah. I didn't figure everything out, but that was a nice, that was a fantastic foundation. Um, but I had some things to deal with, um, recovery from alcohol abuse, alcoholism, whatever you want to call it, uh, got sober in my mid twenties. And that I think started me on a really good journey of looking inward. My kids would, when they grow older, they would say, have a drink, mom. Just have a drink. Yes, it'll be so much fun. I said, you do not want to see me drunk, you guys. You, you, you'll prefer a sober mom. Um, and they got me started. Always, always loved animals. Always loved animals. But I don't remember having the intuitive connection that I have today. But obviously it was latent. Uh, I got to throw that in there just to say, because we're talking about animal communication and healing. I would say the other thing that really helped was joining the Navy as a, as a Navy officer. Because I joined the Navy, they would say, join the Navy, see the world. Well, oh, that was pretty true. I spent a lot of time in the somewhere around the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii, Japan, California. 
and other places. And I met all kinds of people with all kinds of viewpoints about the world. And that opened up my mind to like, wow, there's, there are many ways of experiencing life. Uh, I, you know, you grow up in your family and you have one understanding of how life works and all of a sudden you see everything else. There was a point though, where I was shifting over from, I re retired from the Navy, uh, worked in an association and I wanted, I, I started to get an intuitive hit to change careers and uh, started out with massage and then went to energy healing. And, and that opened me up to my animals communicating with me. Uh, and that brought me into the world I'm living in right now, although it continues to change. But that, that, that's a quick and dirty look at how I got where I am. Well, that's quite an interesting journey, and particularly as you were talking about overcoming your challenges with alcoholism and looking within. As a former addictions professional, a lot of clients who embrace sobriety did so by looking within and trying to find the answers to their to their next steps. Looking within, I think, is probably an aspect of, of our spiritual journeys that sometimes may get overlooked because we have to look within before we can look without, I do believe, or it has to be at least at the same time. Um, because the answers that we, we have are contained within us if we look hard enough and if we silence our mind long enough. I have to ask you this. When you communicate with animals, how do they communicate with you? Is it through symbols? Is it through images? Is it telepathically? How does that manifest in the sessions that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I define telepathic probably different from other people. Um, I think of telepathically as a mind-to-mind -mind communication. So that's the way we're doing it, right? But you think about the mind, and it's the center of where you process all your senses. I have a love for science, so I always have to go to how does the body work. But, you, you know, it's your mind that tells you, I'm seeing Dave. And I'm hearing Dave, even though it's the ears and eyes. So what I'm getting to is that I get information through many different ways. I think it's all telepathic, but how it gets translated, how they send it and how I receive it can show up different for different animals. In the beginning, um, I would just send something. I, I think people, a lot of people start here. I just know it. Uh, the best example I can give is um, when you're in the house and all of a sudden you just know one of the cats or dogs wants to come in. You don't know why, but you go down to the door and there they are, like, let's let me in. So there's a very simple thing there. But, but then I would hear words sometimes. I, I many times see visuals. And it's not like, you know, I'm watching a movie, but in my mind's eye, it's like seeing a memory. That's the best way I can explain it. Also feeling things in my body. So it can be either the emotion can show up, because I know if you, if you notice, your body, when you have a strong emotion, it should, it is, your body's doing it. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I can feel emotions and I can also feel where things in the body aren't going well, um, that they'll just give me that information and it'll, it'll come into my body. One time I felt like a back molar was really killing this little dog and this not killing was really hurting. Mm -hmm. And, um, turns out that's what it was, but I was feeling it. I was feeling the pain because he wasn't eating and he was throwing up and things like that. So every sense that you have from the physical side, you can get that telepathically. Yeah, and I, I think our body does hold a lot of one of our, our emotional trauma and, and pain. The body truly does inform how we feel emotionally, how we feel psychologically. I think that whole connection is really, really important. And 
it it sounds like Mary Beth that you experience animal communication in a, in a very multi-sensory type of way. That's a perfect description. Uh, people think it's just talk, and or or not talk, but you know words coming back and forth. The human language is okay, but if you want to think about it, they're probably sending the information in different ways. And you can start to feel that. They're probably sent it in visuals or physical manifestations, either of um, emotions. Or they're sending memories. I've asked animals who've been rescued, well, what's causing this behavior? And mm -hmm. I'll get a little piece of memory from them that showed me why they've got this fear or, or what, whatever's going on. So, yeah. Yeah, really is multisensory. During our pre-chat, we talked about addressing the spiritual aspects of our relationships with animals and the myths and truths about animals. I think those were two really great topics. Yeah. Let's let's start with what do you see as being the important spiritual aspect of the relationships with our animals? I believe that uh, there are soul families who come together on purpose. And I, I now figured out that animals are part of, those that agree to live with us humans, they're part of our soul family. I want to say strongly that they choose us as much as we choose them. And in the physical world, you say, yeah, yeah, but I saw that dog and I brought him home. He didn't walk over to me. Although there are people who have a many cats who have shown up at their door and become part of the family. So, but for most of us, we're going out and we're finding them and bringing them home. But I believe that there's already a spiritual connection that says we're going to get together and we're going to be part of each other's lives. And each of us is going to receive something from that. And each of us is going to give something. It, it's, I believe it's two ways. And, um, mm -hmm. The other part that I love about that is uh, I have learned by connecting with animals who've passed that their spirits survive death. So for me, love is eternal. So there's no stopping when the body dies. There's there whoever goes first, still there, still connected, still love. Yeah, and and I've I've been a firm believer. Um, in the existence of soul groups that we travel throughout lifetimes with the same group of souls. And that was influenced by the work of Dr. Brian Weiss, who wrote the book, Many Lives, Many Masters. And that's where I had first learned of the concept. What's interesting is a lot of times we think it's only humans that have free will to reincarnate into the human experience and choose their families and choose the challenges and choose the lessons that's going to be for the greater evolution that are their soul. But one of the things I hear you saying is that animals have as much free will as, as humans in terms of which families they're going to be born into or who they're going to choose to be a part of and the it, lessons that they're going to teach. It has, that has um, really become a foundation of my belief system that they are, they, well, we'll go this far to say, is they do have souls, if you can think of souls as an eternal being created by the creator by God, um, and I do sense that they have choices and they make choices. And because they they have souls and they're they're a creation of God, they've been given free will, e mm -hmm. even in the toughest of situations. And well, we can look at the human experience and know that's hard to believe when you see what's going on. With humans, I'm going a little off track, but you say, if if I had a choice to be in this situation, how would I ever choose this? You can see the same thing with animals, but but I do think that there is a reason that they're there and they come with people, and they did choose it at some level, at a soul level, expecting to either to both give and get yeah. while they're on the planet. Yeah, and I think those relationships with our soul families, they have to be reciprocal. We we get something and we give something in return. 
we exist in those relationships to learn specific teaching or lessons for the greater evolution of ourselves. So it's, it's got to apply as well for animals. It, it has to. It, it feels very true to me. Um, I have, I have worked with people and we go in and, and see what's going, why is this person have such, having a such time, a difficult time with her horse. And we go back to a past life where there was an issue that wasn't resolved and they're back again. And they were able to start doing the, believe it or not, the forgiveness in this t- time from back then to now. And the relationship was able to start forward. Uh, and so for them, it was a, had maybe a reconciliation. Like mm-hmm. we, we didn't finish what we were started to do, and we really want to be in a good place with each other. And they gave each other that chance again. Yeah, it's almost like uh, resolving our soul's karma. Yes. You know, by with the soul choosing to, to be in a variety of different relationships to to address past life challenges and to to resolve karma in some way. Yep. That, that's that's perfect. Yeah, thank you for saying it that way. Well, you're welcome. Well, thank you for giving me the, the, you know, the, the information and the content for me to be able to conceptualize that. What are some of the myths and truths about animals? And I'm sure there's a, there's a bunch that I probably, before I became an animal lover, probably subscribed to at one point. Um, it's so interesting, Dave. I, I pulled my book out, Peace in Passing, to say, what are we going to be talking about? And that's where it showed up. I just said, you know, let's, let's see. And, um, because I talk about myths and truth. One of the myths that I think is starting to disappear slowly but surely is that animals do not have rich inner lives like we humans do. And I'm saying it that way, like us. And we are seeing science catch up with that, for me, that truth. You know, I'm I'm reading every time there's something that comes out that said, oh, yeah, and fish care about each other, and so do lobsters, and we can go on and on about that. But if you dig deeper, you you are going to see stories about how how much non-humans experience grief, joy, fear, love, compassion. One of the be- my best stories was um, my friend's dog had loved stu- stuffed toys. She He was given a stuffed animal by one of her friends, but it wasn't his favorite. When when the woman's friend came over, even though that wasn't his favorite, he pulled out the stuffed toy and handed it to her to say, like, thank you, thank you for this. I really appreciate it. And that, that felt to me like compassion and thoughtfulness, you know. And another aspect of that is we think that animals don't grieve. And um, I have experienced that that's not true. Well, but one of the most famous stories, uh, having lived in Japan, is the story of Hachiko, who uh, became the dog of a professor. And uh, he would walk the professor to Shibuya Station every time. And then he'd wait for him to come out of the train station and walk him home. And, and, and one day the professor had, I believe it was a heart attack, but he, he died at work and he never, he never got off the train again. That dog continued to come to the train station for almost a decade, waiting for professor to, to come out. And they now even have a, um, picture of the dog and the picture of the the professor and the dog reuniting in, you know, in the afterlife. It's really sweet, but obviously that's somebody who was really attached to their person and they really cared and was really hoping to see them again. So those are a couple just to get you started on the myths. 
uh, which also tells you what the truths are, is that, that they do have a rich inner life. They do mm -hmm. grieve. Um, so I'll stop there for a second and see where else we, what else can we talk about? Well, I could share an experience to address the fact that animals do, in fact, grieve. Please. Um, two of my favorite cats who have transitioned to Rainbow Bridge, Zoe and Bootsy. Um, Zoe and Bootsy were very close. Bootsy transitioned in his 21st year um, of life. But Zoe was, came into our lives um, as, a, as a gift from our son who could not keep Zoe because he was moving to a place that didn't allow animals. So Zoe would, in her playful manner, would run up and down the hall with Bootsy and I think extended his life for a couple of years. But what was interesting is when he transitioned, Zoe kept looking for him. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that she was her, she was concerned, she was grieving. She kept looking for him in, in the places where she knew he was going to, he was going to be. Um, and animal, and especially when you have multiple animals in the house, they develop for relationships with each other, either, either good or bad. And when one of those companions transitions, it, it changes their landscape and it's an adjustment period. Behaviorally, they may not eat. They may be more withdrawn. They may be sleeping more. You know, much of the same behaviors that humans experience after we experience a loss of a fellow human. Uh, but that's something that you're right, that a lot of individuals don't understand about pets is that they do grieve. It's just more behaviorally. It, yeah, it's so true. I've seen that with um, my cats and dogs more than once. Uh, the joy of an animal, being an animal communicator was when my my little dog uh, Stella lost her big brother Mitsubishi. She Mitsu was a Siberian husky, so she saw a husky while we were walking. She's like, "There he is!" No, so I used animal communication to to invite them to be together in that ethereal telecommunication. That space of connecting so that they could spend some time together and she could see that he was fine and he could reassure her. And it really, it did help. It, it settled her down. And uh, because they do grieve, that's all there is to it. They do. Even the ones that, that didn't like each other, it's like, mm -hmm. they don't get to mess around with that other guy anymore. Especially in a household where there's multiple animals, each are a very unique relationship. They do. They all have unique personalities as well. That's one of the things I ask people to do is to appreciate that, that animals have their own personalities, preferences, and peculiarities, just like us humans. And, you know, you know we may have to get kind of get used to that. Sometimes people expect that if they get the same breed of dog or cat or something that looks like like the past one, that they're going to get us the same personality. Um, I've seen that. And they're very disappointed because there's a different soul in that body. It doesn't matter how, how much they look like the one you love to pass. And so I, I actually I ask people to wait until they, they've got a little space when they lose somebody, mm -hmm. make sure that they're not going to do too much comparing what they loved about the person, the animal who left versus the one who showed up. It's always going to happen, but like, don't make that def the defining factor because that doesn't do anybody a service. Take your time. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So one of the things you've mentioned is the importance of humans needing energy healing along with their animals. Why do you believe that is so important, and how do you accomplish that in your session with pet owners? It's our animals, and our animals' energy affects us. And sometimes that can be positive, and sometimes that can contribute to the problem. First off, I want to say that it is not, it's not usually effective to just say, 
I'm going through something. Just ignore me. I, you know, I'm fine. Oh, I'm not fine, but you, you don't have to be not fine either. Uh, to me, that's like a dog running over to a creek, jumping in the water, and you say, yeah, you can be in the water, but you can't. Don't get wet. I don't know how you do that when you're living around somebody who's emanating this mm. energy, which usually shows up as emotions, by the way. That's how you can kind of catch it. So what you have is, especially if, if there's, there's animals who have chronic behaviors that are super difficult to live with, we people obviously start to have a reaction and we're carrying an energy around that and it affects our animals. Let me say it even stronger. I think it kind of sets them in place to continue to do the same thing. We're setting them up. One of the examples for myself was when I had my my dogs, um, Tibor and Stella. Sometimes they would get pretty growly. And at, at some point I realized that I was get, as I was getting ready to go out the door, here's my leashes and my hand. I would be like, oh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just so nervous and worried about how is the walk going to be this time? And so I started switching my energy to say, well, you know, they're pretty good dogs. Today could be a good walk. It could be, and I shift my energy over. And I, I knew how effective that was when I walked the dogs and this lady and her dog came over. My dogs were just lovely, and they did sniffing, and waggy tails. And she says, oh, you're such good dogs. And I said, how did my mouth come? Oh, yeah, but you see, should see them when they, and then they immediately started like barking fiercely, like they knew exactly what I was suggesting mm -hmm. that I didn't want it to do, but that's what they heard. So I, I could see that I affected them. Helping people get energy healing for this is we go back into the energy of the person. Every emotion or thought has a vibration. So we work to release the energies of those thoughts and vibrations and bring something else in, a belief, a, belief, a thought, a vibration that would be most helpful to the, the animal uh, shifting their behavior. And that's where the that's where the healing comes in, um, so that the person has the ability to reset, like not stay in that it's never going to change, it's always going to be horrible. To I can handle this. Mm -hmm. I love this animal. I love this dog. This cat. This horse. This bunny. And come up with a different way of dealing with them. From the inside, not not just that's just by thoughts, but actually doing it different. I hope that was clear. Yeah, it was very clear because as I was listening to you explain explain the energy piece, it's it's like as humans we have self defeating beliefs that get in the way of developing a positive relationship with our animals. So it sounds like wh what you do is a help individuals restructure those beliefs so that they can have a, a, a more satisfying reciprocal relationship with their pets. And, and I think you're right. I think when we respond to an animal in a specific way, and, and it, it's attention that they get and that reinforces a negative behavior. So if we respond to it with anger or with, you know, uh, trying to, to do some, some disciplinary tactic with it, it's just going to reinforce that behavior even yeah. more because we're getting attention. So it's like, how can we restructure a human's belief so that they, they can, we can have a reciprocal positive relationship and they get attention that is, is contributing to a behavior that is the antithesis of the, of the behavior that is upsetting the human. Exactly. Exactly. And then what, cause I do this for myself cause I also, I now have two dogs who are also two new dogs who are also difficult to walk at times. Um, and I, the, 
And so I'm doing the healing for myself and the resetting. And it's really good because the feelings still come up, but there's the ability to, sh to shift and re I call it reset. Shake. If you were a dog, you'd shake it off. But I'm mm -hmm. not a dog, but it's, I'll use that term. And so you, you don't have to be stuck in the moment. You can actually clear it out and keep going. So you, that's, that's been useful for me. And the other thing, and I don't know if this is a myth that you've addressed in your book, but I wonder how many individuals think that animals aren't intuitive. I think animals are, are very energy sensitive. I think they're very intuitive. Um, I know my cats, you know, when I was having a bad day, they would just crawl on my lap. Another piece with this, and I, I wanted to share this with you, is Bootsy was my daughter Janine's favorite cat. And after Janine transitioned in 2003, um, at the age of 18, we would have her prayer card attached to the refrigerator. And Bootsy would go up to that refrigerator, start meowing and clawing at the prayer card. And I would look at my wife, Sherry, and said, bet you he senses Janine's presence. And that's why he's doing that. Um, and Janine was manifesting herself and spirit to him to let her, to, oh, look, I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I'm still going to take care of you. I mean, even now I'm getting a chill talking about her because that was a very powerful moment that reinforced to me that animals do have strong intuition and they're very in tuned to messages from across the veil. Well, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I do start out with that in the book because I do, I do believe that intuition or sensing energy and interpreting it. Um, that's how I feel intuition works. That they got it, they got it down pat. To think they don't have intuition, you're probably missing. You're probably missing a lot. <laughs> you're not paying attention. I have to say, um, and and so yeah, I do think they they have so much going. In fact, I think they're probably sending and receive, receiving or sending more than we we even realize. And the example I'll give you because most everybody I've talked to who has. Somebody living at home will say, my dog or my cat keeps staring at me and I don't know what they want. I'm like, I said, okay, here's what they're doing. They're going, how much louder can I send this to you, dearest human? Are you, you know, like I'm, I'm transmitting. So I think it's our job. It's hmm. our job to open up, pick up the phone, answer. Because they're already sending and they're already receiving. I think it's imperative that in order to do that is that we open ourselves up to looking at our pets as multidimensional beings. Yes, um, I, I was. I'm still shocked. I, I was uh, at some kind of uh, animal festival thingy as, as an animal communicator, and he looked. He looked and he said, "Animal communicator." Oh, I already know what my dog's thinking. All he wants is treats and, and belly rubs. I'm like, oh, man. You are missing it. I always think of the, the movie The Wizard of Oz. You guys are, but you're still black and, in black and white. We're in, why don't you step over into the world of infinite color and possibilities? Mm -hmm. You're missing mm -hmm. so much. You're missing so much. There allowing you to rub their bellies is more of an act of love towards you than it is as well as it is for them. It's their way of and, saying, I love you. Let me nurture you. Absolutely. And, and it's, a, it's a, for me, it also comes as trust. Mm -hmm. And so the, the other part was that he didn't even feel that they loved him. He said, they love me because I feed them. I'm like, so what you said is so pertinent because I don't think this guy even understood that, that, that there's a lot more. These are not just machines, biological machines that need to be fed every day. They've got depth. Mm -hmm. They can sense when people are kind to them, and that's how they respond to that. They can't say it, 
but they will respond behaviorally by either jumping in your lap or allowing you to pet them, rubbing your, your belly. That's their way to say thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and people also have stories about some of their animals are really good at sensing whether people that come near them are are sick are safe to be around or there's something mm -hmm. bad going on i've heard stories about that pretty interesting stories uh protector dogs who just wouldn't let some handyman come near the the woman who was in the house by herself and it turns out later they that the guy was um committing some crimes against mm -hmm. other women and she says my dog knew it my dog knew it so there's all kinds of stuff going on where they, they pick stuff up that we we don't always realize they can. And another thing, and, and I've talked about pet loss with my uh, students in my death, dying, and bereavement class at Utica University, and I'm sure you've run into this with other pet owners that you've sat with in the United States and around the world, is that they'll get comments saying, well, you know, it's just a pet. You can You can get another dog. You can get another cat. And just as we grieve the loss of a relationship and the nature of the relationship we have with our humans, we each have our unique relationship with our pets. I think of, of, of a pet as a service animal. When that service animal transitions, that person not only lost a trusted companion, they've lost their independence. So there's related losses that go along with that. And you can't replace, you can't replace an animal, just like you can't replace a human. You just can't like go to to the to a store and just okay. Well, this here's my replacement pet. Doesn't work that way. Oh. It's not upgrading your your newest cell phone. You know what I mean? No, I, and it really blows my mind that people are still saying stuff like that. Um, what you said was so good. I also think about it as many times there is a level of love and acceptance they do a better job honestly than we do humans do for each other that we really really miss that uh there's i don't find a lot of judgment anger nope. <laughs> um nope. resentment um even when people think that their animals are acting out of judgment or resentment it's usually fear or a physical oh. issue but it's it's generally not all those negative things. They love us no matter what. Um, that's hard to lose. Mm. And it's and it came in their special form, in, in their particular personality. And you cannot replace that with another being. You'll get something new, but it won't be that one. And and for people to say that, it's just hard because sometimes people have I'm going to say it again, they have more grief over the loss of one of their animals than they have for some of their human relatives. Pets can teach us more about unconditional love that sometimes humans can, because one of the, I believe, most difficult tasks to achieve in this lifetime is true unconditional love. And pets can can teach us that very easily, because they, they are, they're, they're, they're born with love. We're born with love. But a lot of times the human experience gets in the way of us saying that. But with pets, it's all about love. And they can teach us to love, to, to love each other unconditionally if we're, if we're open to those messages and we're open to the fact that pets can be among our greatest teachers. I love that. You know, and I, I was, I had a really weird theory um, that uh, the animal, all the animal species are like, What's happening to the humans? This is our this is our home. What what are they going to do with mm -hmm. it? And they they look over to this is silly, but they look over to the cats and dogs and the bunnies and the birds and the horses and say, "You guys go in, start making friends with the humans. See if you can you can show them what a traditional love is. And get, you know, get in there and start grow, getting these people back to who they are mm -hmm. at at mm -hmm. at their the heart at the core." And the dogs and cats and whoever say, yeah, we'll do it. We're in. Yeah. We're going for it. 
Yeah, help humans find their sense of humanity again. Yes, thank you. Exactly. Perfect, Dave. Tell our listeners about the mission of Sacred Grove and the services that you provide for humans and their animals. The mission of Sacred Grove is to bring the relationship between people and their animals to the the best experience as it can be, even through trauma and um, difficult behaviors, to see how much better we can have lives together. Um, can't make it perfect, but if we can figure out if we can figure out what what the problem is with behaviors and look for ways to release the causes of those and can come into a place where we just live together happily, a, a little happier, because we, we, we want to have a lovely, happy relationship with our animals. That's why they're, mm. they're with us. Uh, and even physically uh, helping people learn, not learn, I think the better word is to give them, I can give them more information about how their animals are feeling physically, which might and he has helped people in their journey of deciding what they want to do with their animal, uh, what kind of treatment or or pain or things that they love or don't love, what decisions they could make, and helping them make the decisions there. And even, and I've done a lot of this lately, and that's why I wrote the book Peace and Passing, Comfort for Loving Humans During Animal Transitions. But working with people and their animals, as they find out that, that their animals are really going to transition, and usually there's a terrible diagnosis, mm -hmm. or they just see them you know, slowing down, not able to do those things they love, and helping them make good decisions because I give them more information. What would this animal like? How is the medication working? Oh, and then actually helping people set up the transition itself, like what can they do? I had somebody the other day who knew that um, her dog was getting near the end, and we were able to ask him what he still wanted to do and kind of floored me because he showed me a canoe. And this lady lives in D.C. on the canoe. But she says, oh, yeah, we're near the wharf. We'll get him on the jitney. He loves going on the water. So that's something... So now she knows what she can do for them. And then giving advice on how to make the transition as, as best as you can so you have good memories. And letting the pet know, here's what's going on. And even checking with them afterwards. It sounds like you work with them to create really great end-of-life memories for the end-of-life chapter of their pets and then beyond. Had to. The communication piece. And, and I'm also working with the new puppies in the house. I, I mean, I'm focusing on end of life, but I got to say that I also have lots of where the six-year-old or the eight-year-old or the puppy is doing things and we do behavioral or anxiety things, rescue dogs and cats. So I got, I've got for all of the life and I've really focused on the end of life stuff. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Mary Beth, if you're going to leave our listeners and viewers with one thing today, what would that be? Uh, that would be that we are all intuitive. I, We don't have to be born with it. Like, you don't have to come out of the room talking to animals. I didn't get it until I was, I think, in my fourth decade. Find your intuitive connection to your animals and enjoy that extra special life that you have. See, see how deep they are. And I would agree with that. I would agree that we are all intuitive. Even for people that don't think they're intuitive, we can pick out at least one or two situations where their intuition served them well. And then we can take a look at those experiences 
and I believe helped them build their intuition based on, on past history of success with that. How can people get in touch with you if they want to uh, uh, contract with you for your services, find out how to purchase your book? Um, let us know what the best way for everybody to do that is, Mary Beth. Thank you. Uh, I, I would suggest that you go to my website, sacredgrove.com, S-A-C-R-E-D, G-R-O-V-E dot com. And there, there's tons of information for you to help you figure out how, how best I can help you. Okay, and all of your contact information will be in the, the program notes uh, when we release the, uh, the podcast. So with that, Mary Beth, thank you so much for spending time with with me this morning and being a valuable guest contributor to the Teaching Journeys podcast. I truly enjoyed our conversation. Well, I did too, Dave, and thank you for um, for listening so well. And, and I, I knew that I was communicating clearly with and with your help to, of, as our, we discussed all this through. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Mary Beth. And with that, that is a wrap on another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I am your host, Dave Roberts, wishing you peace.